And if you would, uh, New Testament book of Titus tonight, please. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 tonight. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3. Uh, I'd like to look just at the first 11 verses, first 11 verses of Titus chapter 3, with this thought, or this title, Good and <coughs> Profitable. Good and Profitable. Uh, we were talking just a little bit this morning about mission accomplished, and Christ's mission is accomplished. We are hoping and praying that the Lord helps us to accomplish in his strength, his mission for us in the church age. Uh, in a sense, this links in because to do so, we need to have a good and a profitable Christian life. But God willing, let's hope we desire to have a good and a profitable Christian life. Everything we do starts with desire, doesn't it? You know, if we, if we, if we err and head towards sin and sinful living and unrighteousness, why is it? It's because we've got a desire to go that direction. We've got that desire in our heart. It took over our, our lust, drags us in that direction, and before you know it, we followed the desire, and the hands and feet have run swiftly to it, and we're in sin. But it's no different with the Lord's righteous work and good work and profitable work. It starts with a desire from within us to want to do the Lord's work, the Lord's will, the Lord's way. And if we have that desire, the Lord will bless us with that desire. It's a desire that's in his will. And the next thing we know, our hands and feet will take us to good and profitable work for the cause of Christ and the glory of God. Now, that's really what this uh, first part of this chapter is going to be speaking to us about, or the major part of the chapter is going to be speaking to us about this evening. Very practical sense, very practical outworking of our Christian life. And, and, you know, for that, we always need the Lord's input. We're so thankful for the eternal truths and eternal salvation. But, you know, the Lord has left us here for a reason. If we're alive, if we've got breath, life, and being, then he wants us to be good and profitable servants. And we can get something of that instruction for us tonight here in Titus chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles open, please follow along with me as I read from verse number 1 down to the end of verse number 11. Word of God says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. They which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. And we'll end our reading there this evening. And may the Lord be pleased to bless the reading of his word as he brings us into association with good works, good and profitable works. We're not saved by works. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that tonight. Sure, I don't need to repeat that tonight. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. We are not kept by works. We are kept by grace through faith. But in the between, between saved and the end bit between kept all the way until we're going to be with the Lord, God has good works for us to do 
because we are saved. In fact, we're ordained, appointed to good works, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us. And we'll look tonight at why that is and how that is, what that means, how should it look like, and what should our attitude be. Uh, this is a little bit about, you know, our attitude. You, you know, what was that old saying? It used to be one of those motivational training sayings. They used to put them up in the posters in gyms and put them up in workplaces to try and get to make work harder. I think it was attitude makes the difference, something like that. Uh, and to be fair, there's a truth in that. That is a truism of the Bible uh, because our attitude to the Lord's work and the Lord's will and the Lord's way, our attitude to it actually makes a difference to the outflow of it in our Christian life. But shall we begin with prayer again? We should bathe everything we want to do in prayer. We need the Lord's help, the power of heaven, the moving of the Holy Ghost, and the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives to achieve anything for God's glory. We can't do it in our own strength and our own striving. Let's pray. Father, Almighty God, we come before you tonight and we pray our Father. We pray for good and profitable Christian lives. Father, we spent many years, hours, days, times, months, many of our valuable moments in life, we spent them wasting and wanton. They were anything but good, and they were certainly far less than profitable. But Father, you saved us, you washed us, you've renewed us. We're new creatures in Christ. We pray for new desires new strength, new direction, new hope. And our Lord, we pray that you would help us tonight. Lord, help us to redeem the time, because the days are indeed evil. Help us to see that which is good, worthwhile, profitable, of value, to turn our attentions and time to in this life and these days till we've got to be with Christ. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you're familiar with the book of Titus, it's what's referred to as one of the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, uh, letters written in one sense to pastors, elders of the church, so all things are done decently and in order. But they have so much truth in there for all of us who are in the local church, for all of us who are out living our Christian life. So it sometimes can be a little bit misleading when we refer to them as the pastoral epistles, because sometimes then as as just as Christians living our everyday life, and I think, well, you know, First and Second Timothy and Titus, they're nothing to do with us because they're the pastoral epistles. They're for the pastors, and nothing could be further than from the truth. There is so much practical wisdom, uh, so much truth in there for each and every one of us for our everyday Christian life that we would be very, very foolish if we were to to cast those things to the side easily. If you're familiar with the outline of the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2 is an incredible chapter about doctrine, but how that affects practical Christian living. And the fact that our true understanding and application of doctrine actually evidences itself in the way that we live our Christian life. But in essence, in chapter 2, it's dealing with that within the church, how we are as Christians within the church. <clears throat> but that primarily changes as we come to chapter 3 because it then deals to the outflow of how we of Christians live in our society, how we should live among the people of the world in the societies and the communities where you and I both live, where we work, and where we live our everyday lives. Now, I've expressed it like this, and I don't think it's a wrong thing to say if you take it, um, you know, with the grace uh, that's over it, I would say that the first eight verses of Titus chapter 3, we see unfolded what I call, and put this in speech marks, the law of kindness. Now, it's not the Old Testament law, thou shalt, thou shalt not, um, you know, make a sacrifice if you don't, but I think it's God outlining to the New Testament Christian the law of kindness that makes us good and profitable Christians and how we are in our wider society as we live our everyday life, because that really is the context and subject of those 11 verses that we have read tonight. And I would like to look at three areas under these 11 verses of a good and profitable Christian life, and this is quite simply that God has placed upon us a great expectation. He has a great expectation of us, firstly and foremost. He has a great expectation of us because, secondly, he has given us a great provision. 
And thirdly and lastly, as a great expectation, he's given a great provision, but because of that and because of his love and his care, he's also given a great limitation. You know, as we mentioned this morning when we were discussing that uh, smacking law up in Scotland, you know, it's, it's not love to let everybody and anybody, and especially your children, do whatever they like, put no boundaries in place. That's not love, that's abuse. And it's the same with our God. In his law of kindness, in his expectation of our outflow of his kindness to us flowing outwards, he does put some limitations on that kindness so that we don't go astray. Firstly, may we look at verses 1 to 3, the great expectation that the Lord has from us. And I'm going to read these verses again. Now, there are some similarities, so I'm not going to go into it in depth. In just a, just a, uh, about a couple of months ago, uh, we did the message about the uncomfortable truth, which was really the Christian's position before government based on uh, Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter 2. Um, it crops up again here in the verse, so I'm not going to major on that aspect of it because uh, if, if you want to know how a Christian should conform and comply with the government biblically, then you can go back and YouTube and you can have a look at that sermon, The Uncomfortable Truth. But we will, of course, naturally have some crossover with the verses here tonight. What's God's great expectation of us under this law of kindness? Chapter 3 and verse 1, put them in mind. Now, can I just ask you something a moment? If you're not in mind, what are you? You're out of your mind. That's what God's saying, isn't it? Don't be out of your mind. He's saying to, to Paul, who's writing to Titus, who was, of course, uh, if you will, an elder ordained on the island of Crete, on the island of Crete. So this is written to a Christian elder, planter of the church. The apostle Paul is speaking to him. Titus is on the Isle of Crete, one of the Greek islands today. And he's dealing with a number and a range of issues. He says, put them in mind, i.e., Stop them from being out of their mind. We need to get them into their right mind. You know, the Apostle Paul had that wonderful phrase, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And as I've said this so many times before, it's a very nice way of saying, you are currently ignorant, and I don't want you to stay that way. This is another wonderful phraseology that we have from the Apostle Paul as he writes to Titus. He says, put them in mind, because the way they're currently speaking and behaving they're out of their mind. They're not in their right mind. They're not letting this mind be the mind of Christ. Put them in mind. This is God's great expectation. What does it start with? To be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now, we'll just look at this. This, uh, this first verse before we go on to verse 2 uh, and, and think about this just for a second. But we've talked about the law of kindness. And in a sense, the law of kindness, God has started at the top of the, the tree in this world, if you will. And he's dealing with governments, kings, powers that be. Again, Romans 13, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. Look at those things. We get cross references. We're not going to go there again tonight. Um, but the Lord is saying, firstly, under this great expectation, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to, be, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Firstly, God has a great expectation that we are not to change the government to suit us. That's what he's saying. Now, remember, this is under the Roman Empire. This is uh, uh, actually under Nero, okay, as we discussed before. And we have this repeated uh, truth from the Lord God again, that God has a great expectation that we are to be subject to the government, not superior to the government. Do you know what subjection means? It means obedient. It means submissive. It means that you are in an inferior condition. You say, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. That's right. And your father in heaven says you are subject, obedient, submissive, inferior to human government. And you say, they're wicked. God said, I don't care what, what you think they are. You are a Christian. And his word to us says that if we're going to be in our right mind as Christians and not out of our mind, but in our mind, we are to be subject, submissive, inferior, obedient to government. 
Now, that word, actually, if it's the same underlying word in the Greek text, if you look in chapter 2 and verse number 5, it says to be discreet, chaste. Now, it's, it's talking about the, uh, the younger women, or let me give context here, let's read from verse 4, that they may teach, now this is what the older, the aged women are supposed to teach the younger women in the church, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, the word, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That word obedient is the same underlying Greek word as subject. To be subject means to be obedient, to come under the authority of. The same thing appears in Titus chapter 2, verse number 9, in dealing with servants, slaves, exhort servants to be obedient, same word, subject, unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again. That is very, very, very clear. We are to be subject to the government. It doesn't matter whether we agree with them. It doesn't matter whether we don't. The word of God is absolutely clear that as Christians, we are to be subject, obedient, submissive, inferior to the powers that be, the principalities, the powers, the magistrates, civil government, civic government, national government. And the word of God is absolutely clear. Let me state this and say this tonight, just in case there is a comeback, and you've got to come back to this. I can't find anywhere in the word of God, and I'm not saying it's not in there, I just haven't found it yet. I cannot, and let's go New Testament, because we're New Testament questions. I can't find anywhere where we have any mandate whatsoever to protest against the government to stand against the government, to have rallies, to have protests, to have marches, to, to demonstrate outside of parliament or anywhere else. I can't find it. The only place where we're allowed by the word of God to stop obeying the government is in Acts chapter 4. When the government ever tries to prevent us preaching the gospel, preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, so should we obey God rather than man? At that point, we have authority of God when he's dealing with the gospel and preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. At that point and that point alone, a Christian can make a decision to defy a governmental law because it goes against the higher law, which is God's word. But I cannot find anywhere else where we have any justification whatsoever in standing against disagreeing with, not being obedient, subject, inferior to the government that God himself allows to govern over Christians in any and every country around the world. Now, if you can find a verse, please feel free and show it to me because I cannot find it. But let me, let me, let me, let me just say this, because you say, well, well, I'll do what they say, but I'm not going to like it. No, no, we are to be subject in both conduct and attitude. Put them in mind. That's how we think. So I'll do what they're going to say, but I ain't going to like it. I'm going to moan about it all. The no, no, no. You are against God's word. You are out of your mind. You are against the revelation of God's truth. Put them, who? Us. To be in mind, to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. Anybody here not like some of the laws that have been passed right now? Right? Absolutely. Some of it's just plain crazy, right? Have we got any justification for moaning about it? No. Any justification for defying it? No. Any justification for not complying with it? No. Any justification for thinking in our mind badly of it, even if we don't say it? No. So that's a great expectation? Yes, it is. That's what we're talking about. It is God's great expectation that if we will live a good and a profitable Christian life, that we will not waste our time, talent, effort, treasure, trying to change the government to suit us. God said, don't bother. The government probably will never suit you. And that's important in conduct and in our attitude. Secondly, 
He says, never mind just not wasting your time changing the government. He has another great expectation in verse number two. He said, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, fighters, aggressive, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. That's talking to Titus in context about the pagan life on Crete. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Greek mythology, but at that time, I've been to Crete a few times in my life. And, it, you know, it, the history, the Greek mythology, and on uh, Crete there, you've got Knossos uh, and the Minotaur. I mean, it's about as pagan as it could be. All around those Christians, about 65 AD, when this was written, they're surrounded by their society with pagan mythology and pagan government. And God himself, through the inspiration, through the Apostle Paul in the letter to Titus, is telling the Christians on Crete, and by extension you and I in the 21st century today, I have a great expectation that you will not waste your time, energy, and effort trying to change the government. And secondly, you will not waste your time, energy, and effort to try and change the culture to suit us. That's what he's saying. Speak evil of no man. Don't be brawlers, aggressive, gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. It's tough, isn't it? Edward and I were talking about it this morning. It's tough. When things aren't going the way we would like them to go, not even as Christians, just as people with common sense and the right morality, when the government isn't making the right laws and the people all around us are about as wicked a heathen as we can be, they're calling evil good and good evil. The flesh is rising up. We want to fight the world. Give us a gun. We'll fight them on the beaches. Well, you know, we'll do a Winston Churchill. And that really appeals to the flesh, doesn't it? And I'm the same as right. I'm like, this is making me crazy. God says, no, 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 you're not in your right mind. Not in your own mind, Pastor Stewart. Settle down. Settle down. Be gentle. Speak evil of no man. It's hard, isn't it? It's really, really hard. So what is it? It's a great expectation that God has. Now, we'll look in a minute how, how he provides us for this great expectation, but nonetheless, it changes it not. God says, don't try and change the government to suit you. Don't try and change the culture to suit you. Be the Christian that you should be, regardless of the government, king, despot, whatever that rules over you. Be the Christian that you should be, regardless of the culture that's around you. Be all you can be and should be for Christ, and that's to be obedient to government, speaking evil, not a brawler, gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, when you get a verse like that, that's when you want to be a Calvinist, isn't it? Well, all doesn't really mean all, right? <laughs> that's when that would come in really convenient. Well, I only have to show all meekness, some meekness, to all some men. I'll just find whoever the elect in that all are, and I'll just do a little bit of meekness for a little bit of men. That's when it would be useful to be a Calvinist. I, I guess, but, you know, the flesh rises up, doesn't it? It's hard to be meek and gentle. It really is. Well, it is for some of us, maybe not for others. It's a great expectation God has. But if you notice there, he's actually listed, the Lord has listed seven duties that he has a great expectation for us. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle showing all meekness unto all men. Seven, the perfect number of God. That's why I call it the law of kindness. It's God's perfect law for the Christian living in this world to live a good and profitable Christian life. God has a great expectation of us. And the reason is, if we direct all of our attention, all of our efforts, all of our time, all of our talent, all of our treasure, I mean, we're awake day and night trying to overhaul the government and the culture around us. We will end up creating a nation, even if you're successful in doing that, you will create a nation that has nothing more than a superficial religious Christianity and a nation that has a superficial morality. And let me tell you this, there is nothing that is a greater obstacle to the truth of the gospel than superficial religious Christianity and superficial morality. Because those who are superficially religious and superficially moral don't believe they're sinners and don't believe they need to be saved. 
So if you spend all your time on this earth trying to overhaul the government and overhaul the culture, you, if you are successful in that, you'll actually create an environment that is hostile to the true gospel. You will have wasted your Christian life. Look at verse number three. God tells us why. It tells us why we need to learn to be obedient. It tells us why we need to be in mind. It tells us why we need to speak evil of no man, why we need to be not violent, why we need to be gentle, why we need to have meekness. Look at verse number three. For we ourselves also were. So we ourselves as the Christian were past tense before we were saved. In our past, God says, think about how you are as the natural man. Think about how you were all the time before you were saved. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient. The very opposite of the obedience is called for in verse 1. Disobedient, deceived, serving diverse, many and various, that means diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. God gave us seven duties from the law of kindness, and he's just outlined seven faults that we have in our flesh before we were saved. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Seven perfect attributes to the law of kindness seven faults listed from the flesh that should have been present before we were saved, but not after we were saved. God has a great expectation. And what's his great expectation? It's quite simply this. We cannot avoid disagreements. We cannot, whether that be with government, whether it be with others. This is what's outlined here. We can't avoid it. But we can avoid arguing about it. We can avoid it. God has a great expectation that we recognize our weaknesses and our shortcomings. We put all of the things and the cares of this world aside. We do not devote our time and efforts. We need to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. God says it's not redeeming the time trying to develop a government that suits you. We don't have to be out on the campaign trail. We don't have to be out on the protest trail. We don't have to keep feeding our minds 23 hours a day with news for junk and drivel. Get in the word of God. Do something useful with your Christian life. Do something for God. And I'll tell you what, God doesn't care which government is in. And he does not care what the government does because the government can do nothing that he doesn't allow them to do. And there's no point you getting all flustered about it when God says, just get on with doing what I've done. Stop putting junk in. You keep putting junk in. All you'll get is junk out. It should be speech that is edifying. Salty, yes, graceful. You know, and that takes some doing, doesn't it? Because this world, it's bad enough in this world that are the things that we cannot choose to ignore. There's that much junk that goes through the eye gate into our brain and down into our heart because we have no choice about it. But you know what God says? He said, he said he's put a great expectation upon us that in the areas where we have choice in our life, we're out of our mind if we don't make the right choices. And we need to be in mind to be subject, obedient, gentle, because we are foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts. What a great expectation God puts upon us. So what is this? God's expectation for every one of us to have a good and a profitable Christian life and not waste our time on the things of this world. Now, God wouldn't put a great expectation upon us without a great provision. God will never call us to do something that he will not enable us to do. What kind of God would he be if he called us to a level of living but didn't make the provision for us to be able to do it? Verses 4 to 8, the great provision. Notice the start of verse number 4. We've got an adversative conjunction, a complete contrast again, an opposite. You see, God says, is this is how you were in the past. But, but, that's God getting our attention. But after, what's he saying? Now, right now, Christian. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, 
But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. That's salvation. Sins washed away, cleansed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment we believe, we're regenerated. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us we were dead in trespasses and sins. But when we believe in Christ, we're quickened. We are made alive. We're washed, regenerated, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So God says, you know, what you have to remember is this is how you were, and I have a great expectation, but I don't expect you to do it in the flesh, in the power of your own thinking. He says, but after the, the kindness and love of God, our Savior to the Lord man appeared. He said, but after you've now been saved, you've been washed, you've been renewed. You're a new creature in Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You see, you are not the person that you were before you were saved, before you became a Christian. You're not subject to your lusts and defeats. You are subject to a new life, a new power. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, that's a great truth about being in Christ, but it does have an if. If, if you are truly saved. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is, present tense, he is a new creature. You are not who you were from the minute you got saved. Old things. What's the old things? Diverse lust, the broad. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what God is saying about his great provision. You become a new person, a new creature in Christ. You have a new power, the power of salvation. You have a new presence, God's Holy Spirit living within you. Mercy, regeneration, and Holy Ghost renewal has been shed on us abundantly, God says. That's how we can have a great expectation. He's empowered and changed us abundantly to be new creatures in Christ. And the old things that used to make our blood boil, they're gone. They're gone. And if they're not gone and if they're not going, something is wrong with your Christian life. And I guarantee it will be about the choices that you make. Because God's great provision tells us that we can meet his great expectation. You know, verse 8, if you will, summarizes the result of the abundance that we have received we cannot be apathetic or apoplectic. Look at verse number eight. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. You see, we cannot be apathetic about our Christian life. This is a faithful saying. God says it's good for us to hear these things and affirm these truths over and over again. So why do you need to do that? Because the flesh rises up over and over again. And we need to be reminded that the flesh must be put to death. We must mortify our members. We must put them to death. So the flesh which lusteth against the spirit of God is put to death. So we will have a godly mind, godly desires, godly action, good and profitable Christian lives. And we don't waste our life and living and substance on the affairs of this world, which is completely pointless and wasteful. We can't be apathetic. We can't be apoplectic. That means just plain mad. You know, the veins bursting outside of your head. No point getting apoplectic. There's a lot of things I don't agree with, a lot of things you don't agree with, a lot of things uh, none of us probably agree with if we think about it. Uh, and we've just taken a, a quick straw poll of disagreement in some of the laws that have been made. Absolutely sure. We can't be bothered getting mad about them. We're wasting our effort. We're wasting our time. Do you know why? Because God is allowing it. God says that his judgment has already started on this land. And so what we're actually doing is we're getting mad against God. Now, that is not a good place for a Christian to be. 
and, and I'm talking about the simple stuff now, and I'm not going to give you a list. I'm talking about the simple stuff, the things that we don't like in this nation at the moment, and you get mad about them, you're getting mad at God. God says, you're not in your right mind. You've got to understand what I'm doing. Do you know what my plan is? It's going to get bad. It's going to get worse. You've got to speak evil of no man. I can't stand Boris Johnson. Is he a man? As far as I know, he is. Is it all right to speak evil of him because he's a prime minister and you don't like it? Absolutely not. Not only are you forbidden by the word of God to speak evil of our prime minister, you are told by the word of God to pray for him. It doesn't matter what flavor or what color of party that prime minister is. Our political choices have no place when they arise our passions as a Bible-believing Christian, because God is basically saying we're getting mad against him. We're brawling with God because he is over it all. He is sovereign above it all. He is allowing it all, and we're getting mad at God is what the basic thing is. Do you know why? Because look what it, what it says there in verse number, um, <clears throat> verse number eight of Titus chapter three. And it's an unusual, an unusual thing. He said, Halfway through the verse, it says, they which have believed in God, again, it's only talking to the saved person. I mean, your average Joe will be walking up and down the high street next to it. They'll be as mad as all get out, and they can be, you know, whether it's the guy selling the socialist work or the morning star, they're mad. But whatever it is, they can be mad. They haven't believed in God. But that they which have believed in God might be noticed as careful to maintain good works. Now, didn't Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 tell us that we are to be careful for nothing? Careful means full of care. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. But here God decides for the Christian, outliving his life in this world, as a good and profitable Christian in our society, he says there's one thing that you need to be careful full of care about, God is saying, this is what you really need to care about. This is what you must spend your time being bothered about. Maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto me. Now I ask you, how many Christians are wasting their time trying to maintain all their efforts and energies and all their works in things that are not good, in things that are, God says, are a waste of time, effort, energy, and talent. When I see a bunch of Christians protesting all over the place, you know what my, my uh, uh, SOP, standard operating procedure is? My SOP is WOT, waste of time. You want to stand on a street corner? Do it with a gospel tract. You want to hold up a sign? Hold up John 3.16. You want to change the government? You're wasting your time. God says you are not in your right mind. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and magistrates. We don't like them. God said, I don't care whether you like it or not. You know, the word of God's not optional. Subject means subject. He didn't say, you know, if it's a government you like, submit. He didn't say that. God's given us great provision. It's the provision of mercy, washing, regeneration, power of the Holy Ghost. We're renewed. We're new creatures in Christ. The things we used to get all hot under the collar about before, we cannot get under, hot under the collar about those things anymore. But we are to get hot under the collar, full of care, and bothered about maintaining good works these things are good and profitable unto men which men well our brothers and sisters in christ first and foremost yes absolutely but to the wider society out between us you know you want to sit on the bus you want to sit on the train you want to sit in the workplace you want to sit in the college you want to sit in the schoolroom moaning about the government moaning about the weather moaning about everything else that's going on you'll find a ready audience and guess what you're a part of that audience you are not going to stand out as a light in this world let your light so shine before men that they may see your what good works and glorify your father which is in heaven be careful full of care to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto men go to galatians chapter 6 
Galatians chapter 6. You know, we've got to be really cautious. We don't just become theological windbags. Good doctrine, full of hot air, no good works. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. I can ask you tonight, is there any one of you that doesn't believe there are multiple opportunities every day to do good and to do good works unto all men every hour of every day. We shouldn't find ourselves twiddling our fingers looking for something good to do for the glory of God. As we have therefore opportunity, God says, we have opportunity every day. Let us do good unto all men, saved or unsaved. Pray for them which despitefully use you, the Lord says. Love your enemies. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. God says, do especially good works for your brothers and sisters in Christ, but do not limit it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is how to be good and profitable to the society at large. That's what Titus 3 is about in context. That's what Galatians 6.10 is telling us. We need to do some good works, even for people who are not saved. And sitting down with them in a hole, adopting the same moaning stance that they've taken, murmuring, moaning, whining, whinging, and complaining, you think they're going to see the light of Christ, if that's the case? God says, I've given you a great provision, and I have a great expectation that we will be different. And he does put, thankfully, a limitation on it. We're dealing with the law of kindness here. Now, one of the problems is, for many Christians, is they take this too far. They think that, well, God's kindness has no bounds. My kindness has no bounds. I can't say anything about anybody. I can't find somewhere to draw a line. But God gives us a great expectation, has a great expectation, gives a great provision, but he does put on it a great limitation for which we should be truly thankful. Verses 9 to 11, look at this. God's limitation, avoid foolish questions. Now, let me just say this. When you ask a question that's genuine for which you don't know the answer, there's no such thing as a foolish question. You are genuinely and sincerely wanting an answer to a question. A foolish question are those that engender strife. A question that you know will be contentious. Avoid them. Avoid foolish questions. And genealogies. You know, that all really links in many ways to the, uh, to the Israelites and all the nonsense that you always find about people trying to fathom out and think that they're Israel, the Dr. Roman Catholic doctrine where the church has replaced Israel or where, you know, we think the Anglo-Saxons are Israel. And there are many genuine good Christians that believe these things, but you know what? They are foolish questions and genealogies and contentions. They're all about arguing and elitism, and the Bible knows no such thing. And strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Once again, God is saying, think about your attitude out there in the world and in church. Think about the things. we Are you asking a question just to create an argument, just to be contentious? And God puts a limitation on that. He says, don't, don't do such a foolish thing. Don't be so fool. But also then in verse number 10, he says, a man that is an heretic. That's a false teaching. After the first, or heresy is a false teaching, a heretic is a false teacher. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Reject. Why? Knowing that he that is such is subverting and sinneth, being condemned of himself. God said, if you've got a heretic, if you've got a false teacher, making a false teaching among you, then Firstly, help them. Give them a first admonition. Now, admonition is help with the telling off. I hear what you're saying. That is not correct. Let me show you what God's word says, and let me show you why what you just said was not correct. Do you now understand what I have just said? Yes, that's your first admonition. So we'll hear no more of that heretical nonsense. 
No, we won't. Really. Now, they might have done that through ignorance. Most people who come up with heresies, usually it's just because they're spouting off some nonsense they heard on YouTube from their favorite teacher. Right? And somebody said it. It sounded good. They gave a Bible verse for it, and off they toddle into church, and they espouse this nonsense, and you hear it and go, here we go again. I know they've been following so-and-so on YouTube. They're spouting that same old rubbish. Right, let us take the Bible and show this poor, ignorant, deceived fool not to spout this rubbish and what God's word actually says in context, right? So we do that because they may just be ignorant or foolish or naive. And then they wander off away and, you know, they followed other links on YouTube or, you know, just read the Bible upside down again or something. And they come in again a second time and off they come again spouting some other nonsense. And he says, now, now we've got to have a second admonition. Give them another chance because some people are slow to learn, right? Or some people are just outright contentious. And they're only happy and think they're making a stand for the Bible and Christ if they can argue with everybody else because everybody else is wrong and I'm the only one that's right. You know, when you start to hear that, you know what you just found? You found a heresy and a heretic. Everyone else is wrong and I'm right. That's a heretic. You're always going to find that. So God says, give them a first and a second admonition. After the second time, you're done. Reject them. Put your toe up their backside. Boot them out of the church. Have nothing to do with them. Reject them from your life because they will drag you down. God gives us. said, be kind. Speak evil of no man. Be gentle. Be meek. A heretic. Give them one chance. They're still spouting heresy. Give them another chance. They're still spouting heresy. God says, that's it. That's where the Lord kindness ends. Heresy is terrible. Reject them. Now, that's why it's important, because even the law of kindness has a sensible limitation. God puts a great limitation on it. And the reason is so that we are not led astray. Many Christians, by trying to be kind, or oh, I can't speak badly of anybody. The Bible says, speak, you know, speak kindly, be gentle, not brawlers. Yes, but he makes an exception for heretics. Because what the problem is, is many Christians, and actually we're in Titus, we're in a pastoral epistle. Let me say this. Many pastors, through kindness, end up embracing heresies and heretics and false teachers for the greater good, and the next thing you know, they're all going down the path of heresy together, or they are condoning heresy. In fact, I'll tell you this, pastors in particular who devote too much time, and, and any time, in my opinion, is pretty much too much time for a pastor, to patriotism and politics, their next step is embracing heretics. I've just seen this recently with a pastor who I admire and respect. And next thing you know, he's sending out emails promoting female pastors and preachers and prayer meetings, dispatch, <laughs> dispatching angels. Don't you wish you had that power? Female preacher who has the power to dispatch angels to protect the government. What are you doing? Nutters and heretics. But you know what? Good people end up bringing them into their fold because patriotism, politics. Get out of that junk. We're citizens of heaven. We are citizens of God. We are God's children. Put it down. Who cares what government's in? I don't like the laws. Who cares? Let's follow God's law of kindness. Be good and profitable Christians. You'll end up, you will end up, when you make those things a priority, you will start aligning with heretics who you wouldn't have behind your pulpit. And next thing you know, you'll be sitting with them in church or sitting with them in their church because you're all standing together for something good and great. God says, no, put them in mind, the subject. You find yourself out of your mind with a bunch of heretics when you devote your time and your talent and your treasure to doing things that you think are good and profitable, and they are not according to God's word. Be careful. Be careful. This is a faithful saying. These things I will that thou affirm constantly. Why do you have to affirm them constantly? Because all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone to his own way. The world pulls us in every single time. It pulls us in, it pulls us in, and we don't even realize the world has got its hooks into us 
and as Paul in the sun. That they which have believed in God might be careful, full of care, to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Do you want a good and profitable Christian life? Do we need to know doctrine? Yes. Do we need to know theology? Yes. Do we need to know the scriptures? Yes. But we need to be careful to maintain good works, not only to those of the household of faith, but to the wider society, to the government, to magistrates. We need to be good and profitable Christians, and we need to be very, very careful where we let our passions and our diverse lusts take us, because you will go to heaven having wasted your Christian life in a so-called good cause. And God said there was nothing good about it, and nothing profitable about it. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. May God help us to do that so our society may know Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we need directing frequently. Our Father, this world is such a powerful influence. And our Father, most Bible-believing Christians I know are passionate people. We're passionate about Christ. We're passionate about the Bible. But, but our God, sometimes those passions, they get the better of this old flesh. And, Lord, before you know it, we're espousing this and we're espousing that. We're fixing this. We're fixing that. And every word out of our mouth has got nothing to do with Christ and all to do with politics, all to do with this world. And our Father, it isn't that we can't have opinions on those things, but we must, we must, we must realize how much profit there is in them. Very little. And therefore, that is the position they should occupy in our Christian lives. That is the space they should have, very little. Our Father, help us, help us, Lord, to be good and profitable servants, to, to be careful, to be really bothered and full of care about using every opportunity we have for good works for the cause of Christ. Father, there is so little time, there is so much to be done. And every ounce of our effort and our energy that is directed wrongly is wasted for Christ's glory and for our good. So our Father, help us to prioritize. Help us to set our affection on things above, that we will have the right desires here below. To guide and guard our conversations and our actions and all that we do, that we keep things in the right order and a right priority. Help us, Father, to keep the flesh suppressed. God, I know as much as anyone how passionate I can be about some of the crazy and seemingly crazy decisions that are made in this world, but Lord, I look to you and I leave it to you, and I thank you, Lord, for helping me with that. Well, some of us who are pastors ought to quit it and become politicians because that's all we speak about. Those of us are pastors. Help us to shepherd the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.